So our next speaker tonight is Mr. Gavin McHugh, and he will join us after his presentation, and he's going to talk about the hip replacement. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thank you very much for joining us, um, uh, myself and Brian, for um, uh, a little symposium uh, from the UPMC SSC. On, uh, and this evening I'm going to be talking on common problems around the, uh, the hip. So um, as is customary in sort of PowerPoint talks, uh, first of all, just like to outline the learning objectives of, of this evening's talk. Um, and this is something that uh, really turns me off when I when I hear a, a, a talk. And I always find it's like a comedian uh, giving the punchline to their joke uh, at, at the very start. So in actual fact, uh, I wish life was that simple and we could just go through in a sort of very systematic way of how things present and how we treat them. But that's not the way medicine works, in fact. And um, that's not the way that any of you sitting at home um, will have developed a problem and, are, are, and the reason you're probably listening th th this evening. All right. And in fact, I'm actually going to completely turn that on its head. And what I'm going to do is just present a few cases and they're they're a little bit cliched the cases, but just and, and please don't and anyone take offense from from anything I've said and that it's just the way I see people present on numerous occasions. And and there are certain patterns in this and a lot have common features. And I suppose the trick will be to see if you can spot yourself as one of them or a relative or a, fat, um, a close friend, because often these things present in quite insidious manners. And um, so the first patient I'm going to present is, is the classic, uh, from, from the hip point of view, is the classic denial patient. And uh, this is, this, and the word stoic comes to mind in that it's generally someone who just gets on with things. And they're, they're often the last person themselves that actually to notice that there's a, there's a problem so everyone else in the family has noticed that this person has been on a downhill spiral maybe even over the last two or three years they're they're slower getting around the place they're they're often grumpy because they're not sleeping at night time due to pain um, and they're considerably immobile and it's it's that sort of like and it is a classic with a hip in many ways in that because it often presents in such a slow sort of as an insidious manner, it just creeps up, up on pay, patients. And what I often know, I often describe it as a farmer in their sort of mid 60s is, is a classic stereotype, but not often by any means. And a lot of people can surprise you. And if they actually come to the consultation with their partner, usually I look across and to every answer that they've said, they're not too bad. The, the partner is rolling their eyes up towards the, the, the uh, ceiling. So this patient tends to present with a lot of stiffness. They've trouble with things like they're getting their shoes and socks early on. They might have trouble, again, if they are farming or something like that, over things like uneven ground. Their walking distance can be really reduced as well, but they just sort of knuckle down and get on with it. And um, sometimes there are people who really just don't like taking um, painkillers. Sometimes there are people who have been absolutely living off um, uh, painkillers or anti-inflammatories for the last couple of years just to get through the uh, day. And uh, as I say, they, they may not have even been able to put on their shoes and socks for the last couple of years. So that I, I just described as the classic denial patient. And, and, and as I say, they'll often, they'll often just say, I'm not that bad overall, all right? Um, and in general, they're, they're walking with a really obvious limp, but they're, they're masking things quite well. Their x-rays will generally show that they have advanced arthritis. And really, when it comes to having something done, unfortunately, it, it is a little bit of a no-brainer in terms of progressing with a hip re uh, replacement. Um, but uh, as I say, talking them into the, to, to the to going ahead can, can be half the battle sometimes, again, usually with the help of uh, family members. Um, so that's the first patient. The second patient that I'd like to present is the sort of the, the super grand type of, of, of character who, um, and patients say, you know, my mom, she's 85. She's um, last year, she was out running around the shops, no problem. And suddenly she's just really, really slowed up in the last little while. Um, and the reason I present it in that often it's, it's sort of, put down to things like just getting older. And I, I really hate this, this uh, phrase and that someone's just deconditioned because they're getting older when generally they just have a worn hip 
And it's a pure mechanical issue that is actually slowing them down. And sometimes patients will, will turn around and say to me, you know, am I not too old to have my uh, hip replaced? And I'm like, well, no, quite the opposite. You're too old not to have it replaced in that the last thing you need is um, is as we get older and our, our strength starts to to, to uh, reduce anyway, is, is to have an extra noose around your neck in the form of a worn and painful hip. Um, and uh, quite often, I, I, I'll suggest to patients that they do actually go ahead on it and that that is, represents their best opportunity or chance of getting back to normality afterwards. And this can be strange in that, as opposed to the sort of insidious decline in, in the last patient, quite often this can sort of like deteriorate quite quickly. And as I say, literally they can, they can say, yeah, three months ago, I was able to do this and I no longer can. I can now hardly get to, to, to put on the kettle in the kitchen to um, uh, make a cup of tea. Um, and uh, as I say, you, you're in, in terms of your mobility, if you're, you'll often jump down a level of mobility very, very quickly with any deterioration in that someone who is completely independent will go down to one stick. Someone who is with one stick will go down to then a crutch or even two crutches. And then as you see there onto the, uh, the walking frame. So the, the, in, in many ways, the more we can intervene to correct a, a mechanical issue, the more we can keep people um independent for for longer and certainly i'm very much off the b belief that um assuming from a medical point of view it is it is possible that hip replacement is not what it was like years and years ago in terms of uh, in, in terms of what it tends to involve with, with the risk and recovery process yes the risks are still there but they're they're considerably lower than they were many years ago when when blood loss was considerably more um, uh, throughout the surgery the third patient then I'll present is the um, the 40 something weekend warrior. All right. And this is someone who um, used to play a lot of sports type of thing. And they um, uh, so they may have played a lot of GA growing, growing up or soccer. Now they play five aside two or three times a week. And it again just tends to come on. They, they may have been aware of the hip or and, and niggle in their groin for, for quite a while. Sometimes they've been getting treated for a groin strain type of, uh, of issue for um, for the last year or so. Uh, and it's slowly starting to, um, to, to creep in with them. And they're finding it more and more difficult to 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 go ahead with their um with their um say for example there the indoor sara or five aside or set whatever it is that they, they enjoy doing again it could be multiple different different sports and um, they they as they can progress quite slowly and oftentimes they'll, they'll appear going with, with a problem but not in bits so they're still able to sort of go ahead with their normal day-to-day -day act act activities but more sporting things are becoming that bit more difficult. Um, and this is something that represents a, a bit of a dilemma because often they have a significant amount of, of arthritis in their hip. And ultimately, the only um, option for them is going to be a hip replacement. But it is a real one to weigh up. So as opposed to the, 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 um, uh, the, the first two cases, this is really, really one where you got to have a, a a sit down and a chat with regarding the, the risks and benefits of going ahead and whether or not the, the hip replacement, and there's a, another patient coming up shortly where, where you have to sit down and go, you know, is a hip replacement going to live up to, to, to your expectations and what you want? And, and quite often these patients actually can be, can be happy enough knowing that the, what the problem is knowing how to ha handle it. And, and if that means um, taking an anti-inflammatory twice a week before they play their indoor soccer, they can they can manage pretty well. Now, things in, in due course will deteriorate with time, but as I often say, there's a, there's a time and a place for everything. And, and just sort of going, jumping into a hip replacement is, is, often, is often not ideal in, in this um, type of patient cohort. And um, it can occasionally be worthwhile trying an, a, an image guided injection into the hip joint itself. And again, I'll speak about that um, with one of the other uh, cases. But sometimes um, what I'll often um, do with patients like this is, I, and it sounds kind of strange, but I, I, I say to them, listen, you know, the option is a hip replacement. You come back when you're ready. And the, the invariable, the question they ask then is, is well, how will I know 
when I'm ready. And it, and it's just, it's, it's one of those strange things. And I say, you, you'll just know, you'll know when you're ready to go ahead. And sure enough, they come through the door two years later, maybe go, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm ready. And sometimes what, what has triggered that maybe waking them up from sleep at nighttime. Um, and uh, th- that's often the trigger. They may have noticed more and more difficulties with their normal day-to-day activities that they hadn't had before. So even potentially getting through the day of uh, in work is more of a struggle. And um, again, things like even getting into a car can be sort of, you know, d- require a maneuver as can putting on their shoes and socks type of thing. And that's often just, these are the type of triggers that they go, yeah, it's time to have something, something done with it. The... Next patient then I'll, I'll present is, uh, and of course this this topic at the moment with with, with the documentary Netflix and and, and pain care and uh, must admit it was pretty mesmerizing. But I, I call this the sort of the, the cliff age type of patient. So this is the patient who really really suddenly deteriorates, and I'm talking going from being essentially normal to be almost like a broken leg type of um, uh, discomfort. So, and this can happen overnight. It could be after even a minor twist they are something just strange. And when you often quiz these patients, they may have been aware of a little bit of stiffness in the hip or, or um, um, the occasional little bit of difficulty with stiffness after sitting, something like that there. Um, but all of a sudden deteriorate really, really rapidly to the point that they may come in on, on two crutches. Um, and often from a mechanical point of view, what, what sometimes just, just happened is, is that a part of the cartilage that was worn has just flaked off or they've just hit a real raw spot. Something that Sometimes the bone beneath has collapsed a little bit and it has just generated a huge degree of inflammation and severe, severe pain. So, um, and, and it's unfortunate in that these are the, the type of patients that really can't wait a huge length of time in order to be seen. It, it, it's kind of cruel to see the, the degree of pain that they can come in with. And, and often, whilst it seems like a, an aggressive sort of act, often just going ahead um, um, as soon as possible with a hip replacement is, is the way to treat these. And, and as I say, it almost is akin to a broken leg type and in terms of discomfort that they'll, they'll present with. Um, uh, the next one we'll call the, the double nappy. So this is the patient who either has a history themselves of issues with their hip as, as a child. So uh, and again, they've often been, as I told, they were to, they, they had a click in their hip or maybe the, their mom said that they had to put on double nappies for, for uh, a few months when they're younger. Occasionally, they've actually been under the pediatric service and had procedures done on the on the hip to try and so essentially they were, they were born with either a slightly shallow socket or indeed the hip completely out of joint and um, the procedures would have been to try to put the the hip back in the socket essentially and, and keep it there with time and th- these are often hips that have have functioned really really well uh, for a number of years but as i often say in terms of if you think of the, the sort of like um uh, from a, an analogy with regards to cars, well, I, obviously, well, you weren't kind of given the, the, the Mercedes type of, of hip, uh, if that makes sense, and that if their hip is a little bit shallower, it's going to wear out at a certain stage. S- some of these patients may have had a little limp, especially with sort of more and more um, demanding activities, but oftentimes they've been completely normal. And the problem is, is that they do deteriorate early. And that's when I say they weren't quite given the the, the Mercedes of um, uh, hips. And oftentimes these people can be in their late 20s, early 30s. Um, and this is the patient who comes in, but, but why me? Why have I now got arthritis in my in my hip? Um, and as I say, it is, again, like a lot of things in this business, it is a purely mechanical issue in that because the socket is that bit shallower, it's going to wear with time and it and it leads to um, uh, development of, of premature arthritis in, in many ways. And no different from, from all the other patients. In general, the, the um, treatment, whilst we try and sort of prolong things for as long as reasonably possible, the, the ultimate treatment for these patients is going to be a hip replacement. Once again, the odd one of these can sort of get some improvement with, with um, uh, an image guided injection, again, with a, with a course of, of, of physiotherapy to, to strengthen up their, their glutes and, and um, uh, g- muscles in general around the area can help and can help um, uh, improve things. With regards to um, 
uh, the, the physiotherapy in terms of the hips specifically. I have no problem with lots of strengthening activities. In general, I'll often say to, to avoid lots of stretching activities. And I find, if anything, lots of stretches specifically around the hip tend to actually aggravate the hip and make it worse. And not frequently I'll see someone who's who's actually been through a rehab that seems to have made things worse enough. And that's the, the reason they just need to pull back a bit from their, from their stretching and they can get, get longer out of the hip essentially before they progress to having um, a, a replacement. Um, the next patient the, uh, is the sort of uh, typical 50-ish year old female who uh, either attends lots of reformer Pilates or yoga classes and, uh, uh, has started to notice some pain in, in their groin area. They may have noticed that some of the exercises either in yoga play, that, that one leg is, is a bit different than the other, all right? But often they don't have an awful lot of symptoms at this stage, other than when they're they're doing their classes such. And uh, this is often the, 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 the patient where so, um, their x-rays aren't that warm, but they are getting some, uh, um, some degree of pain from inflammation around the hip. And um, it is one, and, and quite often they come in expecting a hip replacement as such in that they, they you know, common things are common and, and they're, they're there say, well, I think this is, you know, I'm now ready. Um, and this is the patient, again, when it comes to, to sort of talking over the pros and cons of anything. I, I'm a firm believer in if your range of movement in your hip is almost normal, then a hip replacement, well, it's not going to make the movement an awful lot better. And in fact, the opposite, the movement in that joint afterwards can actually provoke some ongoing discomfort in and around it. It's very easy to irritate a lot of the muscles that, that um, work around the hip joint. And you, you, you can be left somewhat underwhelmed with the result of a hip placement in, the, in this cohort of patients. I would certainly recommend exhausting conservative measures by that. I mean, sort of, um, again, an image guided injection or two in and around the area and and quite often they will actually get improvement with, with this um, and by quite a bit of time before um, um, uh, progressing to hip replacement. Again, I, the, the common theme of this talk you'll see is sort of it's injection versus hip replacement. Why is that? Well, keyhole surgery in, in the hip has a sort of a very limited indicate, uh, set of indications. And, and in general, these are younger patients with, with what we call liberal tears, which are the cartilage tears around the, the hip. And in general, if someone comes in and sees me in their 40s, 50s, 60s with hip pain, like in general, the, there, is, there is no option with, for, a, um, um, for something like keyhole surgery on, on the hip. So we are left with do nothing, trial and injection, conserve uh, anti-inflammatories, versus uh, something like a hip replacement and obviously it's a it's a jump up to a hip replacement and again these are the, the type of patients that need to be kind of very very strong in that are, are we going to go ahead or not and um, the next one patient is the the sort of high level endurance athlete and this is you can just see there they may not be an ultra marathon runner but they they love running their there are 10 Ks regularly. They may have done Dublin Marathon a competitive time last um, year. And they're the people who are left really, really disappointed to find out that they have arthritis in their hip. And um, again, it's quite strange in that it could have been developing for several years, but because they're fit and active, they weren't really very much aware of it. And uh, as I say, they, they're, they're quite disappointed to learn that they have proper, well-established arthritis in their hip and that ultimately, again, all I can uh, offer is a hip replacement. Um, it's interesting that while some surgeons do allow their, their, their patients back running, I, I tend to say that in general, from a mechanical point of view, it it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me run, uh, uh, doing a lot of running afterwards. I'd look at a hip replacement as an opportunity absolutely to get back to the vast majority of activities that you enjoy doing. And if that's indoor soccer, tennis, um, squash, all of these activities, absolutely fine. Five aside, skiing, I have no problems with. If you're the, the type of person who runs, you know, 10K five times a week, I think from a mechanical point, it is likely to catch up with that hip and cause premature failure of the hip. And I, and I think 
getting you know more focused with them um, things like um either swimming or cycling um uh, and what will, will actually buy them a lot more time with their hip but it be either replaced or, or not um, and but again it, it's it's the type of patient who you know is is really quite disappointed to learn that, that in due course that their only option is going to be a, a hip replacement and um, and these are patients as we know as we sort of i i, I think uh, as the generations go in, we're, we're pushing boundaries more and more. And these are often, I, I often see people who are extremely fit and they're not only even 40, 50, 60s, even into their 70s. I, I remember one gentleman who had done the Marathon de Sable the year before, and he was in his early 70s. And it, it just, it's all these activities are incredibly demanding on, on your, your body. And whether we like it or not, our, our, as we get older in age, our collagen is changing. And as our collagen changes, it, it makes us more and more prone to developing injuries. Sometimes these are in forms of tendon um, injuries or, and frank tears. Sometimes they're just pain and discomfort in tendons. Sometimes they're actually joints starting to give way, be they there, any weight bearing joint, be they the hip, knee or, or ankle. Um, and as I say, it can be Again, frustrating for people to know that, unfortunately, whilst their their mind is fully focused, that they they have a joint that is letting themselves um, down. Um, the next patient I'll uh, mention then is is my my sort of cliche sort of tends to be much much more common females around about the age of uh, fifty uh, who enjoys walking, and a lot of uh, middle aged females enjoy walking. And it's great, and it comes with so many additional benefits. But and um, and quite often, these people are are often either just perimenopausal or postmenopausal, and it's a particular, I, I suppose, in, in some ways, uh, um, something that I see quite frequently in that they come with presumed or, or they presume that they think their hip is worn. And in actual fact, their hip is absolutely fine. And where they're sore or painful is over the outside uh, of the of the hip itself. So um, uh, just to the side of, of their buttock, essentially, they can't lie on that side. It's incredibly sore so, um, to even press the, the bony prominence over the side. And as I say, this is is completely unrelated to the hip joint itself which usually presents with pain in the groin area and um, and that the pain is on on the outside and um, but can be extremely severe as well and really stop people in their tracks so this and uh, as i mentioned in terms of tendon this is where, where your your gluteal tendons insert into the the, the tip of the great canter and unfortunately they're put under a lot of demand when when we're um walking the the insertion becomes either inflamed or just mildly sort of degenerative and i'll often describe it a little bit like a frayed rope uh, in terms of how it's uh, it's presenting and giving uh, symptoms and um, so the, these are the patients who uh, not needing a hip replacement need a course of physiotherapy need um uh, and potentially can get relief with with a steroid injection over the area and, and quite often it'll take a second or even third injection to settle this down Sometimes people's uh, their their own GP will be able to to give this. Um, sports medicine will often do a lot of the, these as well, and I'll see some some myself. But it's just it's just to know that potentially it's not the actual hip that's the cause of the problem. Extremely um, common. I in one clinic last week, I must have seen a twelve people in a row with, with with a similar problem, and it just seems to come in waves. Potentially around this time of year as well, or people are trying to do. To get more and more walking over the summer and it's only after a couple of months that it really starts to um, uh, limit them in their in their tracks and and, and on the one hand whilst i think the exercise is, is really really good and comes as i say with multiple benefits not just from a musculoskeletal point of view and um, it it is a, a activity related and sometimes it does mean sort of pulling back on 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 the walking a, a bit in general, stopping the activities isn't going to work in that if you, with these degenerative type conditions, if you stop the um, uh, the activity, as soon as you start start back again a few weeks later, it'll come back with, with a vengeance. So you have to try and sort of limit your activities and as a strengthen the area up with, with um, uh, some physiotherapy, the injection, and which I'll often suggest a talk with our GP in terms of uh, on the assumption that that they are sort of perimenopause that 
and um, things like the the formulations of HRT that are available now can make a considerable difference. And uh, I think it is, it is important that there is no doubt that estrogen plays a, a very important role. Obviously, it's well beyond the remit of, of my level of expertise, but as I say, it's just something that I that I see really quite frequently. So, um, as I say, I hope you 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 find the last few few patients just a little bit interesting, and and hopefully some of you recognise them, um, uh, as I say yourselves or our family members among the crew. It's by no means the limit of what we see in a day to day. It does represent the fact that these things, even though the, the the diagnosis is quite often just arthritis, it can present in a multitude of different different ways with pain, dis discomfort, and. Uh, at the end of the day, I think it makes a lot of sense to get the vast majority of these issues addressed and, and, and treated and, and to potentially prevent them getting getting worse with time. Um, thank you very much. And if we have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. Hi, Gavin. Welcome. Now, Gavin's joining us from his car. If you Good want to flashing lights, sorry, he's actually on his way to a, a hip meeting in Cork. So thanks for joining us, Gavin. Um, thank you, Fiona. That's okay. So we're going to have some talks. Uh, first one from Declan's question is, how do you know when you need a hip replacement, particularly if you're not in a lot of pain? Yeah, um, in general, I would say if you're not in a lot of pain, you probably don't need a hip replacement just yet. Um, yeah. Particularly if you're younger, I would say it is a case of getting a bit more out of it. Um, I, I spoke about the sort of the disability aspect of things as well, and I do I am conscious sometimes in, in, in younger people that a lot of stiffness can really cause trouble and catch up. So, but again, it's, I suppose that's where the, the consultation comes in. We're seeing someone and seeing how they act and behave and how it is interfering with things uh, and helps make the decision. I, I suppose in, in many ways is that the number one question to ask yourself, is it impacting on me? on a daily basis and, and that could be in your work in your leisure or whatever and significantly hindering it and that's that's the ultimate question to, to ask and that determines whether whether or not you not need it as such but would benefit from it okay thank you um someone cast so can you go kayaking after a hip replacement and my general answer to everything is is yes right the only thing I've, i'm not sure i did allude to in the, in the talk but the Long, longer distance running, I, I recommend, you know, you stay away from, but anything else. And now the kayaking specifically probably involves uh, quite a degree of, of, of hip flexion. But the, these precautions we, we put in place for the first few weeks until everything heals up. After that, I, I, I ideally want someone to have as close to a normal hip as they possibly can. So I, I, I'm happy with with whatever. Right? Um, years ago, the risk of a hip dislocating or popping out of the socket was considerably higher when um, we use a lot, not to get too technical, but, but we use a, a, a lot smaller of a head than, than we tend to now. So in most females now, I use a 32 mil head as opposed to our and males would be a 36 millimeter head. So if, if you imagine it has to jump the radius in order to get out, whereas years ago, the head was only 22 millimeters. It was much mm. smaller. You know? So um, it should enable people to, to, to enjoy a lot more and activities as such okay good someone else has asked something similar and i'm not sure about nordic walking do you know what nordic walking is nordic walking in terms of the poles Ice. and stuff yeah, yeah i think so yeah absolutely so we we actively give people the nordic walking poles and um, yeah. uh, usually a couple of weeks post post up so um now that's just to get the the walking style the nordic style is is actually really beneficial after hip in terms of getting you upright and getting the weight going through the hip and getting a a, a sort of a, 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 a normal gait pattern as such without it without limp so i would nearly actively encourage it yeah okay um so if someone's they're saying if they had a first injection first of all for the pain relief and it's only lasting for about 72 hours is it worth trying a second one probably probably not is the is the answer right and that and injections in a hip can be a little bit hit and miss. They they do seem to sort of work a lot lot better and more rel more reliably essentially in, in knees. But I I do think there is if if you get it early in the hip, there is a real role for it. And some people can get looking get like, you know eight nine months out of a, a single injection. You know, so um, yeah. but 
two or three days. I mean, it's not going to do any harm. Is it going to help more? Possibly not. You know, I don't think that that's any. It just depends on how badly worn it is. You know? Yeah. Uh, Ron was asking about perceived satisfaction rates. Are they generally higher for the hip than the knee? Um, in general, I would say yes. But the I often describe that a hip's own worst enemy is itself, and that the general consensus and among the public is, is that hips are fantastic and easy and have no problems, and that knees aren't nearly as good and that the outcomes aren't as good. So I think people automatically come in with lower expectations with knees. And, you know, a lot of the happiest people you'll see are people that have had their knees replaced and they go, it was a complete game changer. Now, yeah. on a similar level of hip, but if someone comes in with a little bit of discomfort in the hip, uh, uh, you know, either over the side, which I spoke about, that trunk and terry pain, or an occasional pinch in their groin or something out there, they're almost, you know, quite disappointed that with it because they were expecting it to be perfect. At the end of the day, it is a replaced joint. It's generally a replaced joint that is a hell of a lot better than the one that was in. In fact, you know, 97%, 98% of the time. Um, And probably, say, you know, possibly half of those, maybe even more, would have a completely forgotten hip that they wouldn't even know. They'd nearly have to think which hip was replaced, you know. Um, But some people have just that conscious sensation that it just feels a little bit different whether that's psychological so people will describe you know it feels like they're sitting on something. you're not sitting you don't even sit on your hip joints so <laughs> you yeah, it's kind yeah. of like you're sitting but it's just i think it becomes a conscious awareness for for some people that it just hasn't quite settled down yeah i think someone here is asking about does it recur that a hip prosthesis can be pushed too high where the ball might be inserted into the cup and cause pain so i suppose that may be a perception after yes. surgery yeah, exactly. So some it feels like that. So the the, I mean the the ball is in the socket, right? So it cannot, you know, it should not move within the yeah. socket as such, all right? Bar a millimeter or two, right? But just a normal walking, it is articulating in and against the socket. Now, anything can happen. The 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 socket as well. The socket can migrate up within the bone that it's fixed in, right? But you know, it's it's extremely unlikely, um, and um, uh. Other things can happen, but but rarely actually nowadays with hips. Thankfully, they rarely rarely move once they're they're in. Yeah, and um, okay. we sometimes see hips that are twenty twenty five years, and they start to to, to um, create problems such as that, like you know things actively loosening or wearing away. The plastic liner can start to wear away. Um, again, that tends to be older hips that have been in place for years, where the plastic wasn't the the same high quality that it is now. So. Touch wood, we really don't see it on, on, on modern implants as of yeah. yet, anyway. Good. Somebody is asking, uh, and it's probably for us as well, how does one manage your schedule if you need a full hip or knee replacement? But I suppose most people will start with their GP if they haven't uh, been to their GP, wouldn't they? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the um, um, most will start with a with a um, uh, a, a, a GP referral, and I think occasionally that is important as well, especially. Um, the majority of people are going to be going through their insurers and on occasion more and more you'll find insurers asking to to see yeah. the GP referral and, and if there was any queries and anything it just it, it's just like you know a, a, one little obstacle that they like putting in the way so and I think ideally it is absolutely um, um attend your GP anyway but it's just yeah. um, I, I think it can keep things safer for the for them in the long run as well yeah. and look and also there is a number there on on the ask a question or also to get in contact with the GP liaison. She'll also help you with talking through referrals as well. And Gavin, I think your own secretary numbers are up there as well. So they need to do that. Um, can you distinguish between tendinopathy and a hip and a mechanical hip problem? Um, in general, well, yes and no. Sometimes it can be difficult. In general, the tendinopathy that I spoke about over the side is excruciatingly sort of touch just over the bony prominence of the side of the hip. So usually th- th- that's it. So sometimes patients that have labral tears. Of- can prefer um, the pain to out over that side of the hip. So occasionally it can be tricky, but, uh, you know, an MRI or, or an MR arthrogram, which is uh, an MRI scan with um some dye injected into the joint can help sort of delineate that. But a lot of it is just in the, in the, in the history itself of where the problem is, what, how it's aggravated, and it's, uh, you know, for example. 
Yeah. Um, someone's just asking about the bilateral, and I suppose that maybe asked about what's the recovery like to have a bilateral hip. Um, sorry, I was just swiping away messages. Okay. <laughs> um, so, in, in general, the uh, I sorry, I'm going to use my my normal um, uh, uh, analogies here that you love, Fiona. But the the problem with a with a bilateral in the first day or two is you're almost like a tortoise and it's back. All right, and um, because the single hardest thing. Getting out of um, uh, bed, all right? So you have to actually start off with the hardest activity, all right? Um, normally, if you've one side done, you can use the other leg to kind of hoosh yourself out a little bit. But with both done, it's that little bit more uh, difficult. Once you get over that, all right? And this is where people, uh, yeah, it takes a huge sort of leap of faith. After the first day, day and a half to two days, right? It, it almost it, it is like the two hips just recover at the same pace. And... I, you know, I say, I would say, this is when one hip is four weeks old, the other is four weeks old. They genuinely come in. And I, I touch, I, I, patients come on back at six to eight weeks post up. There really is no difference in the, in the bilaterals to the ones that have had one side. Yeah. They walk in everybody as well. In fact, sometimes they're, they're even better off. And um, uh, same with the bilateral knees. And it's something again, like from, from my point of view, I mean, not to, to sound so, there, there is actually no sort of motive behind me to, to doing all the two to get all of them. As I say, it, I, I've seen it work and I've seen it work so often. And I, and I think it really is an opportunity for patients sometimes to, to get things fixed rather than sort of push it out for another six months, another yeah. year and so on, you know. So uh, someone did ask that, but he, what he's asking about is why he says he has to, that uh, he wants to have a full knee replacement and has also been told he needs a hip replacement. How does get one get around that? Um, it, I mean, in general, the it, if it's on the same side, in general, the, the consensus would be that you start with the the hip on, on uh, above because a hip will occasionally refer the pain to the knee but a knee won't refer to the hip. So we, we tend to start with the hip above. Now, I have done, um, on occasion, I have actually done the hip and knee together uh, at the same setting. It's a little bit more unusual than, say, a, a, both hips together and both knees. But again, it just depends on the patient. And, and I don't mean to be, but in terms of what they're actually up for, what I think they're able for as well. And uh, um, um, that's it, right? Okay. <laughs> it's certainly okay. not... It's not it's not that common to have a hip yeah. and knee done at the same time, but I've done I think three or four or five times that sort of number. Okay, so I've just got one question here that someone has asked about the cross border because just the cross border isn't back at the moment. Um, so you do there are if I get Rebecca again the GPLAs will get in touch with prices if you're interested and we'll just email you there as well. Um, do you need a referral from your doctor for the cross border? Not really, or from the north? We don't. If you give one of us a call, we'll go through the what is it isn't the cross border at the moment, but we can still go through the process and the prices with you. And if anyone there is from Northern Ireland, I am up there all Monday and Tuesday. It's on the website. I'm going to do various talks in Omar, in Nuri, Belfast, Armagh, and in Balamina. So if you're in any of those areas and you want to come along, um, I am talking about um, all surgery at SSC now that the cross-border is gone. So listen, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, we will be sending a survey out. And remember, these talks are available on the website um, in the next few days. Thank you.